Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking your time uh, and participating in what I think is going to be really a transformative platform uh, for our community. Uh, I'm excited to be here with my, my friend John Donovan. Um, Thank you, Robert. Love being here. Pleasure. I'll tell you, you know, it, it's interesting. John and I have gotten to know each, over the la know each other over the last few years, and it's funny. You know, last year when we were in Davos and uh, we were talking about some business uh, things, and I said, John, I have a question. I have one ask from you, and I said, I need 50 internships. And John said, done. You got it. And so as our seed investor uh, on this platform, I'm quite excited uh, about having AT&T, having you as our partner uh, in driving this forward. But I think for those who don't know, let's talk a little bit about you know, the importance of internships and how it led to the narrative of your background, which led you now to be CEO of AT&T Communications. Well, you know, um, I, I, I don't know if I speak for you, but I speak for a lot of successful people that I don't belong here. Um, you laugh, but I'm going to tell you the story. You know, like, I, I, I'm an urban kid, one of 11, and, uh, and I and You grew up in Pittsburgh, right? Pittsburgh, right. yeah, yeah. Steeler fan, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so... Uh, Broncos, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a few duels. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, and so when you look back, there's always that moment where you got that backdraft and yeah. that lift that that moved an idea to a dream and a dream to a passion. And there's nothing, I think the greatest force on earth is when, you, when your will turns to like yearning and you want something. And I don't think there's a greater force of energy on this planet than when you want something. And so those early formative years are all about that, uh, that transformation. And so personally, you know, we're from the days where they didn't have likes and digital resumes, I typed letters to every single yeah. firm in the city of Pittsburgh mm -hmm. that had an engineering department. And, um, and as I was thinking back when I was looking at what we might talk about, and I was thinking about it, and it was really profound for me because I, I only got one offer. Yeah. And I probably sent 75, 80 letters. Mm -hmm. And I took a bus home from Notre Dame to Pittsburgh to go to an interview, and I got the job and uh, my father passed away between the time I got the job and the time I started the work. Um, but I, I looked at my paycheck, and I was such in shock, and I went and I looked at my dad's paycheck, mm -hmm. his last paycheck, and uh, I was making more than he did. Right. And, then I, you know, and then you realize how this whole thing is a chain of events, mm -hmm. right? Your, mm -hmm. your parents do the right thing with you. You get your opportunity. You get your shot. And then you wake up, and so you look back and you say that internship transformed my professional career. Right. Because I don't, I don't, I don't belong here, but for a bunch of you know really good uh, events, and that was one of them. Right. Talk a little bit about that first internship. What was kind of the, the dynamic that occurred when you first walked in, and we how do you think about that in the context of the internships that you all offer? And I'll get to that a little later as well. Yeah, you know, it was a very different world. Um, I, I was uh, went to Jones and Lachlan Steel. I was an electrical engineer. Mm -hmm. And I went for the summer, and I was in such um, reverence of like having a job and you know figuring out what to put in a briefcase, which at that time was nothing. Um, <laughs> figuring out how to tie a tie, right, right. and uh, all of those things where I was trying to fit in. Right. And I look right now, and if look, if I could start my life over again, I'd be I'd be exactly where the interns are right now, right. because man, every three years the game's changed. And they walk in, and we'll give them projects to do, and they'll have impacts. I mean, we're, we're doing work in, in a company that's 100, at least my port, part of the business, $160 billion of revenue, and we're taking interns' work and putting it right in the field. Right. And that, that was, that, that's unheard of. Right, right. As, as, you, as you think about today, you know, and, you know, the challenge that these interns, our interns and our intern programs have, Think about, you know, give me a little bit of, give them some advice as to, you know, here you are, you want to get this new job, get this job in this corporate organization. What are the things that they should prepare themselves for and their mindset and any tools that you think they should, they should look to get? Well, I think my mindset would start with, you know, to get into the workforce is where, you know, rubber meets the road. And I think a lot of education is where the rubber meets the sky sometimes. Right. And so you've got to bridge the gap there. And so I think you know, uh, the most important thing is to just get in the game. Mm -hmm. And I think when you have that first internship and you perform during those summer months, then you get your job offer early. 
Right. And now you're in the game. You right. know what I mean? And yeah. now you're oh, in yeah. the game. And now you can go and you can interview with a lot more confidence. Mm -hmm. And you're not nervous when you're in there. And I remember um, I was a very average student. Uh, well, that's an overstatement. I was below average student. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but when I had, when I had the, the job offer, I interviewed at 12 places and I got 11 offers mm -hmm. in my senior year. And you know why? Yeah. Because they knew right. I had game. And the right. way they knew I had game is I had the offer. So I, I think that there's this practical level of you can come in and make a difference and you can change all the world and all that, but don't forget it's get in and do a good job right. and get that foundation because once you have the foundation, you have a platform to build from. Yeah, now, I'm going to flip right. it around, though, because everybody here looks at, you know, I'm probably new to them. They look at you and you're iconic. I don't What's, know about iconic, but yeah. You know, no, no, no. <laughs> you're humble. And that's part of being iconic. But uh, so this is interviewing the interviewer. Uh oh. Oprah did this to me once. She flipped me, and it was oh, like that's the whole dangerous thing. in this theater. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it's only fitting. Uh, what, t tell, what, what's your internship experience? You know, um, that's a good question. Um, it actually started at your company, AT and T. Back then, it was AT and T, and I worked for a little division you had called Bell Labs. Yeah. And uh, some of you may or may not know the story. I've told it a couple times, but I think it is one of the things that informs me about a the importance of internships uh, and, and exposure. Uh, but why this is so critical. Um, my parents were, were teachers, and you know, we didn't have engineers in our family. We had a couple of friends who worked in, they said, I thought they were engineers, they were really draftsmen, uh, worked in the defense industry. Uh, so I had no one really to point to or look to and say, oh gee, I'd really like that career, and that seems interesting and, 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 and motivating. But they introduced computers at that time into my high school, and I was talking to the teacher, and you know, he said, well, tell me a little bit how this works. And they talked about these things called transistors. I said, well, tell me, what's a transistor? And they told me a little bit about it. They said, oh, it was invented at this place called Bell Labs. I said, man, they must have some smart people there. I want to go there. And so I found out they had a Bell Labs in Denver, Colorado. So I called them. I said, hey, you know, do you guys offer internships? And they said, we sure do. If you're between your junior and senior year in college, uh, we have internship programs available. I said, that's fantastic, because I'm a junior in high school. I'm taking AP classes. I'm getting all A's. It's <laughs> exactly the same thing. And they said, no, it isn't. And I literally, like you, you know, 75 letters, I called the human resources woman every day for two weeks. She stopped taking the call after the second day. I called her every Monday for five months. I left my calculus class, went and put a dime in the pay phones. Pay phones are these things you guys used to manage, you know, and used to, anyway. Oh, oh, I know, they yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, put a dime, anyway, and, uh, and I'd call and I'd leave a message and I'd leave a message and I'd leave a message. And I got a call back in June. I got home one day, my dad said, hey, you know, this woman from Bell Labs called and said you, she wants you to call her back. So I called her back. And she said, listen, we're not guaranteeing you anything, but, because uh, we don't know you, but a student from MIT didn't show up and we have one open slot for our summer intern program. Would you like to come interview? So I put $2 in my 69 Plymouth satellite. I had one suit, so I put that on. Uh, and I drove out there and got the job. And I ended up working at Bell Labs throughout college and created a co-op program and those sort of things so I could yeah. go back to school plus pay for college. Um, and what was so interesting, and I tell people there's, there's a couple lessons there. One is you know, the tenacity of following through and following up. And I'm sure the, the reason she called me back is I'm the only person she had a valid telephone number for, because <laughs> there were no answering machines back then, right? Uh, and the second reason, which is probably important, is you should hire Cornell students, because MIT students are unreliable, right? <laughs> <laughs> Cornell, there we go. Um, that changed my life, John. Yeah. Um, I, AT&T did a wonderful job. Bell Labs at that time, I shared an office with this guy by the name of Vic Hauser. That was my first mentor, and I want to talk about the importance of mentorship for, for, for in, in, in your context as well. Vic Hauser, Hauser was a PhD in solid state physics. This guy had 35 patents. I shared an office with him about the size of half of this carpet. And I can tell you now, but you know, every day after lunch, he'd take a nap for about an hour and a half, and then he'd go back to work. But, <laughs> Uh, he taught I, me. I look for those people. Yeah, now. yeah, because you know, right? You're, you're, seriously, right? I'd like to hang out with him. He'd, he'd, you know, we'd go eat lunch and then he'd go to sleep and he'd turn around. And he'd put the phone right here and he'd wake up and get back to work. Um, but what was brilliant about him is he forced me and challenged me to challenge myself. You know, yeah. the first day, he's like, "Great, you're this new intern." He said, "Okay, here's our problem. We got this operational amplifier. It's failing in the field. You need to figure out why." 
You've got the full resources of Bell Laboratories and library. Libraries for you young folks is where we used to go get information. It's like <laughs> the pre-Google. But it's the full resources of Bell Laboratories uh, at your disposal. Ask any questions that you want. And you turn this chair around. I'm like, wow. First of all, what's an operational amplifier? What's it supposed to do? What's it not doing? And I went to the library and I talked to a bunch of people and I came back, here are my questions. And then he'd get on the whiteboard and would spend hours answering the questions that I asked. And he said, you have any more questions? I said, nope, I'll come back as soon as I learn more, right? That was the dynamic that he and I had. And I tell you, it's what he taught me more than anything else was the joy of figuring things out. And I try to I tell my kids, there's three lessons for them. That's one. I said, well, what I want you to understand is the joy of figuring things out. The end of that summer, I had the best, think about it, I'm a junior in high school. I had the best project of even these juniors and seniors in college, college yeah. and won the award that summer. I was like, wow, this is cool. And I convinced him to hire me the next year, right, or that, that winter. And I made $147.50. And I, had, I didn't know that, that, I thought that was all the money in the world. You have more than that now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Round it up a little bit. Um, but the importance of that mentor, the importance of being in an environment, look, I was different than everybody else that was there, uh, but it was a welcoming environment with the person who actually cared about my development, not feeding me the answers, but fed me the process for finding the answers. And I, I, that sticks with me today. Yeah. So, Let's talk about mentors in your life. But before you jump in yeah, sure. to the mentors, I look back and, you know, I think the, the magic is you, the confidence because you felt smart. Yeah. And no one could tell you any different right. that you felt smart. Right. You felt like you were, you, I, can do, I can contribute. Right, right. Uh, mentors, you know, I, I'm not a, the biggest fan of mentoring per se or networking. Mm -hmm. I, I want an advocate. And I always tell people, if you're coming in here into my circle, I'm an advocate. And that's going to be start with some really hard news now and again. But I'm, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not here to give you drive-by advice. And that's the problem I, I find a lot of mentors. Yeah, I'll mentor you. You just sit down and have lunch. You buy. Yeah. You ask a bunch of questions. And, right. I'll, right. and I'll tell you what's on my mind. Yeah. Uh, and then when it doesn't work, I'll blame you. Right. You need to follow uh, up. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so what I look for in an advocate, and like if you find an advocate, you hold on to their leg and you don't let go. And that's someone that will tell you, you know what, you're ahead of yourself. You're not as good as you think you are. You didn't put the effort into this one. Mm -hmm. You know, so many young kids, I'll put them in situations, interview a job and not get it. Yep. And sit down. And they think I'm going to make them feel better. Right. And I tell them, you know, the person before you who just got promoted out of that job mm -hmm. did a darn fine job. They got promoted and you didn't even think to call them and ask them. Yeah, what they do? Right. What did you do that worked? Yeah. What do you think the next step would be? And so th those are the kinds of things you, that I think that when you get a mentor and you can push them into an advocate, mm -hmm. you know, so, so still today uh, I, I have those kinds of conversations. I, I, I spent, I, I used to try to spend 20% of my time on working with people. Mm -hmm. And because uh, there's no greater satisfaction than I have than watching people run either past me or be their greatest self. Because every organization, you got it. Exactly. When, if, if, if you look, and I don't care what it is, sports, business, it's not a question of like genius. It's a, if everybody's their greatest self and helping everybody else. So it's, it's funny, um, you know, the, the, that's the kind of thing I think that passes itself down a lot, a lot better. And then people say, you, ought to, you need this non-obvious choice. So mm -hmm. I started this process, and you know, internally they call it the Rooney Rule. It's not the Rooney Rule. I say, if, the, if, if someone is hiring, mm -hmm. you give them five candidates, and that's the policy we run. You get five candidates at AT&T, and the hiring manager picks the best one. And one of those candidates is a diverse candidate, mm -hmm. and one of those candidates is a non-obvious choice, someone out of left right. field right. who put effort into online education, and you know what? If you look at the, the number of people of color that are, have been promoted, the number's 44%. It's eye-popping. Right. And it has nothing to do with anything other than people say, pick the best of the five. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so those non-obvious choices, the hard workers, that kind of stuff. And that's where the mentoring thing gets rubber meets the road because yep. someone will call and say, because it's, it's, it's not only allowed, it's expected. Yep. So in our organization, people will call and say, you gotta, you got to get this gal on your list because... 
she's killing it. So and, how did you force that cultural dynamic for the, and you know, again, it's a part of this opportunity, you know, create the opportunity for folks to be seen, to be, you know, to be viewed and to, to participate. Well, how I have a lot of people, that yeah, I have a lot of people telling me I think differently and I don't think differently. I always tell them I just think the way I think and yeah. if it's different than other people, I'm sorry about that. But I looked at it and said, you know, how do you get the best candidates forward? You don't go and say, we're going to have a diversity and inclusion program. Right. You know, or you go in and say, we're going to look at numbers. Yeah, you can look at numbers, but that doesn't matter. What matters is you get five solid candidates, and then you go into, into the HR group, and you say, you know what? It, you can't have five candidates that don't have diversity. You can't have five candidates that don't include someone who's busting their hump online to get an education. Mm -hmm. That doesn't even make any sense to me. It's not... It, that's not diversity, that's just business. It right. doesn't even make walking around sense. You got right. hungry people mm -hmm. and you can't get them in, in front of people. Right. And then if you look at it and you'd say everybody takes the right person and then you know they pick the best person and the hiring manager says, man, I got a, a great candidate. And then when you're all done, you look at the numbers, they say, congratulations, John, we're doing really good at diversity. Right. Well, right. It doesn't, you know, it, it's not diversity, it's business. You right. do right business, you do it the right way, things happen. Right, no, I agree with that. So there's, there's a dynamic, and I, and I want to get back to this a little bit on this mentoring, because I agree with you, mentors and advocates, and the way I've always approached it is, you know, go adopt the mentor, because yeah. no one was actually kind of saying, hey, let me go take care of this kid from Colorado. You know, you know they didn't care, right? Um, and I get that. But I looked at people who had a certain skill set that I aspired to possess and to master. And so that's how I really viewed, you know, the idea of mentorship. And to your point, it's like I, I, I actively adopted the mentors. I mean, one dynamic I've always shared with, with folks is when I was in a corporation, big corporation, once or twice a week, no matter what I was doing, I would have lunch with somebody in another division. And yeah. I'd do that, hey, let me buy you a tuna fish sandwich. Half the time they'd buy it, the other half I'd buy it, but that's okay, $147.50 goes a long way, a tuna fish sandwich at a time. But yeah. the, the dynamic that actually helped me was actually sitting and say, okay, well, tell me a little bit about what you do, and you're in a completely different division. Why do you like it? You know, why'd you choose this? And what I learned more than anything else is the people that were happiest in their careers deliberately pick those as opposed to kind of falling forward uh, in, in the corporate chain. Right. And I learned that at a young age, and I said, well, Robert, what is it you want to do? And what, that passion, and how are you going to manifest that in these companies? And I realized the best way to do it was to be an expert at my craft. And so let's talk about you know, the development. You have this Workforce 2020. I want to hear a little bit more yeah. about what you're doing at AT&T. And how do you actually think about developing talent and developing people in the context of skills development as it's so critical in our tech-enabled tech world? Well, we had a math problem where we were trying to um, look at the workforce of the future. It was 2014, and uh, we looked at the organization. And I was running, at that time, technology and operations. I didn't have the whole company to deal with. And I did the math and I said, okay, we're about 50,000 engineers short. Mm -hmm. So any, anybody looking for 50,000 engineers, you can't find them at Home Depot. Can't. You know, yep. uh, and so you look at that and you have to retool your workforce to get those kinds of numbers. And so we started a process of building a curriculum and it's blossomed into something that's bigger than anything we could have imagined back then. So we have 150,000 people that are doing online education. It's competency-based. Mm -hmm. Uh, we build a system that says, here's where the company projects you to go in the future. Um, but if you can pick any future you want. You, you want to switch and be a data scientist and you're starting from nothing, right. you can get there, mm -hmm. just more effort. So we paint a vision, the company gives the tools, and then the individual puts the work in. And so they, the thing that's been most gratifying, like you can look at all the corporate stories, the thing that's most gratifying is you can take a kid from an urban neighborhood who has a 12th grade education and $13 in his pocket, mm -hmm. and he can get a starter job somewhere. Right. And he can get promoted a year later, mm -hmm. and then he can start the process of educating himself. The number of people that went from retail into the IT department right. and are now writing code mm -hmm. who always belonged in an engineering, but they just never had the right education, the right... Uh, environment around them to create that that energy that took advantage of what they were capable of, and now we just have these stories that are blowing up bigger than life. And you know, honestly, I, I would have never imagined when we started. We started and said, "Can we train twenty thousand people?" Yeah. We got one hundred and fifty thousand, uh, and and we have. So these are not like little efforts. Right. We we've got. I think 1,100 people now have gotten master's degrees in computer science. 
we have 12,000 people that have nano degrees. Right. Are all the courses delivered through your infrastructure? All, all online. And you know, we, what we did is uh, we just did something that I think is one of the boldest things a corporation has done. We took the platform and we said, let's take the entry level jobs and let's open that up in the city of Chicago to the most, the neighborhoods that suffer the most from gun violence. We went to the south side of Chicago, west side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. We started opening the stores at night and putting mentors in. Perfect. And having people volunteer to help people get through these curriculums. And we've hired 880 people in Chicago, more than half of them from those two neighborhoods. Yeah. And, uh, and so we opened up a call center on the west side of Chicago for our elite customers. And you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, you want an elite call center, you ought to put that in the Philippines, or you know, here's a really good thing in Malaysia. I got news for you, west side of Chicago is working really well for us. And 87% yep. African American, more than half of them come from those most violent neighborhoods. But then you have to deal with some things in business that are a little unusual. We had to figure out public transportation is right, unreliable. Late at night, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got to get them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, ride sharing. Right. Um, people don't show up because um, their kids are sick. You need daycare for sick kids, not for well kids. Mm -hmm. um, and then you got this thing where if someone doesn't show up on Tuesday, your job as a manager is not to mark them absent. If they've been through childhood trauma, you need to call them up and say, your family's here. Right. You get here. It'll all be okay once you get here. Mm -hmm. And then you see the employees. <laughs> thanks. Mm -hmm. And you see the employees starting to care for each other. If someone says, I'll stay a little late to cover the extra hours for this. And then you start to get this, you know, family environment. And we're tracking these folks just because, you know, the greatest thing for us is for them to move to a better job later. Right. So these, these, these platforms can be a great leveler. Mm -hmm. exactly. But some of the smartest people I know, like when I, grew, I mentioned I grew up in an urban area, and one of my best friends, I was with him last uh, August, and he said, you know, I've spent more than half of my adult life sleeping on the couch in somebody else's mm -hmm. house. And you realize how close you are right. between success and exactly. failure. And so you look and you say, I'm blessed. How do you make this work? These kids, some of these people are brilliant and never have the opportunity. Right. Now, here's the thing that's so great about the interns. You're walking in now. And, and for those that are administrators, you've got to get them into these internships. You've got to push them into it because um, th this world is a lot flatter than the world when we were growing right. up. Right. Now, it might be slanted a little more in certain right. cases. But here's the thing, in any field, four years from now, everybody's obsolete. Right. And, there's, and competency has never been more important. Mm -hmm. And learning the language of a business and gaining experience and being an insider matters a lot less than it ever had. Right, exactly right. So, so you, you, know, you take chances on kids all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure in, your, in the financial side of your house, you have these young folks that are coming in. No question. And they are brilliant. And there's right. going to be a junior in high school that's going to call you and say, Mr. Smith, <laughs> I'm going to call you every single day. And I get them. Until yeah. you bring me in, I can make this happen. Sometimes they, they, they fall off after two months and like they didn't have any tenacity. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but in all honesty, you know, technology has enabled that. I mean, so, you know, we, we similarly at Vista, again, 50,000 employees plus, we have the capacity and we've delivered through our Vista University that same sort of nano degree capability. And I think it's important that A, you have to create exposure, B, you know, you're finding talented people where you otherwise may not find them. To your point, I grew up with a bunch of guys at some of them. I remember my high school counselor said, oh, you should be a bricklayer. This guy now has a PhD in biology. Right? Yeah. And because didn't have necessarily the opportunity or the right guidance at the time, but you know, the tenacity and then finally found that right spark and frankly the right infrastructure to help develop their skills and talent. It is now incumbent upon executives at companies to do that. Government's not gonna do that from, from what I can tell. And so how do we now encourage more executives in the office and companies to say, this is the right answer, this is the right thing. It is sound business, no question about yeah. it. How do we make sure they understand the importance beyond what I call the dearth of the talent, which is our challenge, our biggest challenge, same as yours, yeah. we can't find the people. That's why we built out you know, Vista University. We just can't find enough artificial intelligence and data scientists, so we gotta build them from in, in within. How do we get our, our executives to now you know, get on board with this? Well, I think that um, there's, there's a couple of things that come to mind. The first thing is that we as an organization and every company, um, they have to get accustomed to creating opportunities like you had at Bell Labs that might not last a lifetime, right. but might last for five years before you go to graduate school. And so, you know, to try to get a fine screen that gets a lifer is not, you know, like you're going to have to learn how to 
manage on a little bit more of a, a, a treadmill. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, that I don't think anybody's going to look and take big risks. It's going to take people like you and like me to not be afraid, not afraid to be judged. Yeah. I mean, you, you press us all the time. And, and you know, um, when you called in the Vista thing, I mean, you made it sound really easy. You came and said, I want 50 internships. And I said, done. Um, but I had already done the research and said, if I'm, if I'm going to be genuine, authentic, and local for the community, then I have a unique advantage because I got trucks and technicians and people who live in, in I, you know, the Sh Believe Chicago program I just talked about, you know, the, the gun violence isn't, isn't a theoretical problem. I have three technicians that got shot. Mm -hmm. So you can't walk away from those problems, but you can expect that you can lecture your way there. Right. You have to lead your way there. Yep. And, and, Activity, and yep. people like you inspire people like me. And then I, I get inspired to do my job, and then it inspires other people. And so you have to light a match, and you never know when that, the, the next match is going to be the inferno right. that, that lights the thing up. Mm -hmm. And I just think the bottom line is, for executives, you can't be afraid. Like, I, I, you know, when you talk to any great leader, and you say, like, once your education is over and your experience is out of the way and you have a big decision and you'll remember some of your big bets, mm -hmm. you go inside mm -hmm. and it's a lonely feeling because there's no business case, there's no math, there's no partner. It's you inside saying, I'm going to take this chance. Right. And right. it's the magic you can create that causes other people to look up to you. And that, you know, that's kind of what it is. Right. Find a few leaders and get out there and make it happen. Great. Let's 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 uh, flip a little bit because I'd, I'd like to talk about STEM education, the importance of it as as a dimension here. You know, you and I are living in this world where it's just rapidly changing in terms of the skills that are required. And frankly, you know, I've got you know five thousand open recs that I can't fill today. We've got to continue to yeah. build. You've probably got twenty thousand open recs you can't fill today, and in, in that dynamic. Um, talk to the students here. Talk to them a little bit about the importance of, of building out their capabilities in STEM education and what that what the future looks like for AT and T. What the future looks like for every, frankly, corporation yeah. on the planet. Great. Well, let, let me tell you a story through the eyes of my oldest daughter, who's 29 years old. Because I always feel like if you're going to tell a story to someone, it's one thing to give advice, but if you can't give, if that's not the same advice you gave to your kids, then it's a problem. So. Mm -hmm. So my daughter was uh, in a public school system, and she was in eighth grade. And the teacher said to her, honey, I don't think you're going to be very good at math. And so I think you should get into something that's more language or arts. And so uh, she went to art school. And I told her, you know, and nothing against art, but I told her only 2% of people go to art school make any money in art. And she said, but that's what I am. And so a teacher defined her in a box. Mm -hmm. Then she got out and she, she went to NYU and she got out and she said, Dad, I hate art. <laughs> I said, I'm not surprised, honey. Mm -hmm. uh, I will cover you for three months. I want you to go online and I want you to figure out how to take your whole portfolio, digitize it. I want you to put it up on the internet and then I want you to, I want to do a Google search of your name. Mm -hmm. You better stay up on the top of that Google search. Right. And then I want you to go to hackathons mm -hmm. and find the spot on hackathons because those engineers don't know anything about design, art, or flow. And so you get out there. And so my, my, the long story short, my, within the four months, my wife and uh, my daughter was working for one of the most elite digital design firms in the world, loving what she was doing. And the whole thing was a combination of having to overcome the problems that an early teacher can do, telling women what they can't do, which is, you know, crazy. And then realizing that you can take what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So when I look at STEM now, right. I always tell my son, you can be a great engineer. That's easy. I had to actually, you know, that button you press print. I used to have to write code. <laughs> right, exactly long right, to print out. <laughs> to get a print. And then to print it this way. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. <laughs> oh, shoot, it came oh, yeah. out the wrong way. I got to right. write 10 more lines of code. Um, but no one should be intimidated by this STEM world. We use the word STEM like it's this high mountain to climb. Right. It's not. Just get in the game. People are smart. They'll figure it out. Yeah. And these tools are out there to make it so much easier. So that it's STEM for the masses. And there's a... It, a big shortage, as you point out, but the shortage is the shortage of people that are, have the courage and the willingness to go pivot. 
Right. Because, I mean, there's nobody who studies English who can't write code. Yeah, and you know, the dynamic that we face, of course, is international competition. So exactly. it, it is, you know, listen, short answer is this. I, I tell folks, call it 370 million people here, 1.3 billion people in China. Guess what? Computing power is now ubiquitous. When you and I were growing up, you'd go to the computer room and you'd get an hour of computer time and somebody tap you on the shoulder and, you know, you have to go back out and sign back up and then you worked in corporations, you had to charge your clients, you know, $1,000, you know, mm -hmm. use an hour of computer time. Now it's 50 bucks a month all you can eat, right? It has changed the entire dynamic globally as to who has access to computing power. And right. the companies like yours, we are now all connected to that computing power and we have all these devices that are connected to it. So the opportunity to create wealth has changed. Okay, the opportunity to create for, for to be an entrepreneur has changed. Before it took massive capital, resources, the right people. Today it's just how do you get you know, access to $50 a month and insights and information. Yeah. So the real question is how do we now encourage our population also to become entrepreneurs, to live in that world as an entrepreneur as opposed to just work as a corporate citizen? I don't know if you have any thoughts in terms of how you all are doing it at AT&T to get people to be their best selves. Yeah, before I, before I jump into AT&T, I, I feel like we're in a, in a strange time. Now with emojis, we're going back to cave drawings. Right. Um, so there's certain but they move. elements yeah. of this. Yeah, but they move. Yeah, they, they wiggle and such. But, but uh, technology is a great equalizer. I mean, we're in the process of finding that nobody will have a mathematical challenge. No one will be language challenged. Mm -hmm. No one will have, uh, have to say, I never learned that because it's right at your fingertips. And so the tiebreaker now is willingness and hard work. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds funny, but we're back to the days where, you know, um, will and effort mm -hmm. and uh, is, can carry you through skill. And so I mentioned earlier that skill is now more important than experience. And now I'm saying will it, it more can carry you through skill. more important yeah. than skill. Right. It says, you know, we're, we're in the, e the, the most equal playing field we've been in, in quite some time. Um, if we convert skill to opportunity. And that's why we as a company are all about the non-obvious choice. Right. Because it, 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 you know, the non-obvious choice can be anybody who woke up this morning with the fortitude to say, I want better, I want more, I want to do something. And it can come and non, and so those hungry folks, mm -hmm. they can produce. And so, yeah, you still need elite talent. And I worry a little bit that there's this divide happening um, that's greater than ever, but I don't think it's tools, and I don't think it's, I think it's opportunity and will. And if we're, I'm trying to get my folks to buy into the concept that says, if someone's got the will, we should provide the opportunity. Right. And that's how we have to think about it. No, I think that, that's the right answer. Um, I'm gonna go with a, a last question, just in terms of kind of final insights um, to share. Look, we have educators, we have, you know, people who are running some nonprofits, folks who are, who are partners in, in this effort. Um, what are some of your final thoughts in, in terms of what you think we need to be thinking about in terms of making sure this is successful and broad scale? And like people, I don't like doing things in ones and twos. I want them in hundreds of thousands. Yeah. And, our goal of 10,000 is half of what my real goal is, and that is half of what I think it, it, it's going to be ultimately in three to four years. But what are some of your thoughts and, and insights? Yeah, in terms of, I, of I, don't, I don't think that um, you'll ever be guilty of thinking small, Robert. So <laughs> um, that, that isn't a concern, but I, I think that everybody involved has to think a little bigger. And I think a lot of it is a little bit of stepping out of your comfort zone. So when you look and you say, well, we're going to go to this um, university in Virginia, mm -hmm. they're gonna find opportunities for their kids that might be in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. right. And that's, you know, you want the one next door and you want it to be just right, but that's not the way the world's working right, right now. Right. And I think that getting people to be out of their comfort zone to say, go give that a shot. And so if we do this program well, we should put a blanket around it so people can feel warm and comforted. Because there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be strangers, strangers to the workplace, right. strangers to the city. And then what we've got to do is realize that it's not about what you getting them there mm -hmm. or what we can get out of them. It's about putting them back into the school for that last year with that bit of confidence you right. had right. when you were slaying it yep. at Bell Labs. Yep. And uh, Still the best summer project I think they've ever had, but... 
you know. That's yeah. just my opinion. Yeah, no, they still, they have a plaque up on the wall. The wrong, only they one. They have a whole wing, the Robert <laughs> Okay, Smith there wing. we go. Yeah, good. I know. Good. No, but I, I, I think this thing is like underappreciated, the confidence of a, a 20 year old, right. or, you know, or an 18 year old when they move, you know, in the olden days, um, in the very olden days, they used to, when kids stopped listening to their parents, mm -hmm. they used to hand them over to mentors mm -hmm. and said, this is now your mentor. And everybody who had three kids, when they became teenagers, they ended up with somebody else's three kids right. as the advisor to them. Mm -hmm. And we've lost a lot of, of, of that. Yeah, that I fabric. Think, yeah, and so I yeah. worry anytime these programs are in. So I hold my folks accountable. And I, I personally go meet with the interns. Mm -hmm. And I'll sit down with them and I'll say, like, first of all, did we get the right mix? Are there enough women here? Are there enough, right. you know, people from the Middle East and enough people, you know? Like, What was your biggest surprise from meeting with the interns this summer? Um, Either good or bad. You know, good and bad. The good is they actually thought that they were going to change the world in eight weeks. Yeah, good. That, you know, that's good. the good that's, thing. That's the attitude like, you want, absolutely. You know, you say, well, you know, what advice do you have for me? They said, implement the stuff I did right away. Here it is. Because yeah. that's going to make all the difference <laughs> in the world. I love it. Say, yeah, we're going to save 100000 bucks. I got a $14 billion quarter <laughs> right. to make there. So, um, so the, that, I think that hubris that exists is a good thing because it's channeled in a way that when we were growing up, our, our demure um, approach to the workplace, it was respectful, mm -hmm. but it was not going to light the world on fire overnight. Now, so they, they are a little overly ambitious, but they come, they want to they ask me, what do I believe in? They want to ask me what my values are. And so I love that stuff because that's all, you know, yeah. like I, I, if I can't hold weight with, young kids asking me what I stand for, um, that's really good. And on the downside, um, you know, they want to come late, leave early, and make sure that there's happy hour and scooters around. <laughs> but, you know, that, that comes with time. First kid born, and it changes the whole <laughs> that's formula. That's it. You got it. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. I think the dynamic, uh, I, I like to, you know, and hopefully we will inculcate this with a lot of our interns, is a is dynamic of engagement. You know, I like to think about, you know, I, I learned early on when I was now going to college and do work first, I was likely going to be the only person who looked like me in that environment. So I had to actually take it upon myself to engage yeah. with people and, you know, help them understand me and also take the time to get to understand them. That engagement dynamic actually created the confidence of engaging and the confidence of then producing and sharing ideas and thoughts. You know, you and I as digital immigrants to some degree yeah. have a lot to learn from these digital natives. And we have to create the environment for them, you know, to share themselves and to share their ideas and their thoughts. Maybe a hundred thousand dollar thought that day, but it might be a ten billion dollar thought the next. Yeah. And we just got to create that environment for that to. to yeah. One happen. of the things we did, which has really worked out, is uh, we asked them to wear their as much as they can their school uniform, like a, a oh, yeah, golf cool. shirt, yeah. t-shirt, every day. So people will say, "Hey." You're from Texas A&M. Good say, idea. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I say, great. Then you make sure the team has coffee every morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the school pride is part of what they wear. And that also, like, the, the experienced employees can say, you know, hey, kid, come sit with me at lunch. I want to hear your story because I went to the school with you. Yeah. And so, so I think that's an important part of it. If they can't leave with confidence, if they don't feel like it's family, you can't do big numbers if you don't have people that are willing to get on an airplane right. and go live somewhere in a strange place. And so I love what you're doing is that, mm -hmm. you know, you're adapting. So next year with your scholars program, right. the elite of the elite, we're going to do the housing and all right. that because, That's awesome. yeah. yeah. So, so we're excited about that. Like that's the next ratchet up. Let's, you know, deal with housing and get them in. But you know, at the end of the day, it's family. I always tell them, you know, if, if I can get you in my building, then you will be a, a near a lifetime employee right. in most cases. Mm -hmm. Because you come here for the project, you fall in love with the people, you can change jobs 10 times and keep the same parking space. Yeah, love it. And, and love you, it. you can't get that anywhere in Silicon Valley. You can't get it um, anywhere outside of, uh, at least I believe, outside of AT&T. Because we're a company with a soul, and that's a, that's a big selling point. So when we get a You can man, get that at Vista, but I understand. John, I want to thank you for being a wonderful leader, a fantastic friend.
And, I, and I, in all honesty, I want, I want to thank you for, for setting the, the way for other corporate executives. And we'll continue to you know, do what we can to support you in your efforts. And, and thank you for being a, a good friend. Robert, it's a, it's a pleasure to work with you. You're a great partner and friend. And uh, you know, uh, it's, it's right, but it's business. It, and is. it works. It is. So there's no compromise. It's all works. Let's keep doing thank it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. John Donovan. Thank you.